Praise God. If you're watching online, type it in the chat. He's risen. He's risen indeed. Somebody do this. It's a good Sunday. Today is the day of victory. That tomb is empty. The stone's been rolled away. The cloths have been folded up in a nice pile left in the tomb. And there is no body in there anymore. Amen. That is our hope. It's funny we use the symbol as a cross for Easter. Really, the symbol should be a tomb. Because really the cross is just the death, which is important. I mean, he bore the sins for our, you know, he, he, he became a curse for us, but everybody dies. It's really only looking through the tomb that we see power in the cross. Amen? And so... I feel like our symbol for today should be a, a tomb. It shouldn't be a cross, but we'll do with what we have. Well, today is Resurrection Day. We're going to be talking about the resurrection and what the resurrection means for you. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. The famous passage in John chapter 3 is John 3.16. So many people know it. For God, that he, that whoever shall not perish. Yeah, no King James people in here? I didn't hear any. That's the famous verse, and that's probably the central verse of the passage, but um, the context is really important. I've heard lots of people preach, preach on John 3.16. I've heard some people preach on John 3.17. You know, not about condemnation. He didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world. But we're going to be talking about John 3, 14 and 15 today. So it's going to be a little different. Would you stand for the reading of God's word? We're going to read all of uh, John 3, 1 through 21. If you want to just hang out on the keys until that, Tim, you're, you're doing amazing. I love it. Oh, this is the word of the Lord. Doesn't get much Easter than this passage. Here it goes. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and he said, Rabbi, we all know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. How can a man be born if he's old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he can't enter into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, unless a man is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Flesh gives birth to flesh, spirit gives birth to the spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases, you hear it sound, but you can't tell where it's coming from or going. So is it, everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are a teacher of Israel, said Jesus, and you don't understand these things. I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and we testify what we've seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you don't believe. How then are you going to believe when I speak of heavenly things? No one's gone into heaven except the one who has come from heaven, the Son of Man. This is going to be our central passage. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only Son, and whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love the darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it can be seen plainly that which he has done and which he's done through God. 
Amen. Would you turn to your neighbor one more time? One of you say he is risen, and the other one say he's risen indeed. Thanks, Tim. You can be seated, everyone. He is risen indeed. All right. Let's break this passage down in its context before we get to the meat of everything, okay? So you have this Pharisee who is a teacher of the law. He's, he's part of the ruling council of Jewish leaders, and he comes to Jesus at night. And we get this impression he has to see Jesus. Like, this is one of those moments where it can't wait any longer. He's like, I need to go see him. But it's ironic because up until this point, Jesus really hasn't done a ton of miracles. You have John chapter 2, which he does the first miracle he's ever done, where he turns water into wine. And then we hear uh, later in John chapter 2 that he does some other miraculous signs. We're not exactly sure what the miraculous signs are. Um, But then, uh, you know, when Jesus is in Jerusalem at Passover, we see the famous passage where Nicodemus was probably there where Jesus flips the tables in the temple. Let me just read this passage for you, just to give you some tone for it. It says, uh, When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went to Jerusalem, and in the temple courts he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords, drove all the people from the temple area, both sheep and cattle, he scattered the, t- the coins of the money changers and overturned tables to those who sold doves. He said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remember, remember that it was written, zeal for your father's house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded him, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority? And Jesus says, destroy the temple, I'll raise it up in three days. And the Jews replied, it's taken us 46 years to build this temple. You're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he was referring to was his body. And after he was raised from his dead, his disciples recalled what he had said, and they had believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing in his name and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need men's testimony about man, for he knew what was in man. Okay, so Nicodemus probably didn't see a ton of miracles. We do see that Jesus had some miraculous signs, but Nicodemus is probably at the temple when Jesus is flipping tables. Now, I, I want you to consider this, all right? The, the Jewish leaders and the Jewish ro- ruling council and the Pharisees and all these people were the people that had Jesus crucified, all right? And this is like the first event at the temple. So probably Nicodemus's friends were probably pretty mad at Jesus, okay? They probably uh, were feeling all this frustration. Imagine you're just having this religious service, and somebody starts coming in here and starts unscrewing the pews and starts flipping them over and says, this is not okay, this is my father's house, and starts going crazy. Yet there was something in Nicodemus that he couldn't get his mind off Jesus. That he's like, I got to go see him. Now, he doesn't go in broad daylight. I imagine if your friends are the ones that are kind of offended, you don't want to come up to Jesus in the middle of the day and say, tell me all your secrets. But he comes in the middle of the night, we hear. And he asks him some, some questions. And you know what? I see Nicodemus in this spot. And I see somebody who's been touched by Jesus. And now... He's got some intrigue. He's got something about him that he just can't let go. Like something about Jesus has drawn Nicodemus to him where he's like, I got to go see him. And I wonder what it was like at Nicodemus' house where he's sitting there and he's like, should I go? Should I not go? Uh, What should I do? And he's just like, I got to go see Jesus. That's the effect that Jesus has on people. Just like Jesus says in this passage, you must be born again. He refers to conversion not as this I say yes and check this box, but conversion as a spiritual rebirth. It's a, it's a becoming a new person. It's being born again. And so if the process of coming to Jesus is like being born again except born of the Spirit, then the intrigue part would be kind of like the contractions, 
okay? I'm just thinking about this because we got a baby coming uh, next month, and it gets me thinking like this, okay? Nicodemus is starting to have what I like to call these spiritual contractions, where he's like, oh, I got it. You know, he, he starts going on with his day, and then something reminds him about Jesus. And this is what it means to be touched by Jesus. When you are touched by Jesus, when you are influenced, he starts to get your attention. Some of you might be coming to church today because it's Easter and you don't really come to church, but you're, you're, you're intrigued by Jesus. There's something about Jesus you heard last Easter and you can't get your mind off of it. Something keeps dragging you to church. Something keeps dragging you to these conversations. You've been touched by Jesus and now you find yourself like Nicodemus coming in the middle of the night might be sitting in this place with your arms crossed, didn't sing any of the songs, but something about it. Jesus is drawing you in. He's doing what he does best. And what I love is, even though Nicodemus, he sees Jesus and he doesn't go, I want to follow you in broad daylight. He comes at night. It's kind of cowardly. He's got one foot in, one foot out. That's okay for Jesus. He, he will take that and work with that. If all you have to bring to Jesus is, I'm going to stay at this distance. I'm going to investigate. He's going to work with that. That's the Jesus we serve. Now, if something about Jesus intrigues you, I want to encourage you, keep seeking that. Keep exploring that. Dig a little deeper. Figure out. The Bible says when we seek, we're going to find. And I guarantee Yes, you might have laid in bed one night and you said, God, if you're real, show yourself and you didn't have anything. But if you keep seeking and seeking, you are going to find our God. He's going to reveal himself to you and he's going to do a lot more than just touch you. He's going to transform you. I love the picture of the woman that needed healing when Jesus was on his way to another miracle. Jesus is walking by. He doesn't touch her. And she's like, I'm not missing this moment. So what does she do? She touches Jesus. And sometimes you got to get out a little bit. You have to take, it takes a little bit of faith. It takes a little bit of you stepping out and seeing and exploring. It's a partnership here. And so God must touch somebody's heart. Listen, the gospel has never been about fearing people into the kingdom of God. If you don't follow Jesus, you're going to go to hell. Oh, I don't want to go to hell. I want my ticket. It's never been about fearing. It's about his loving kindness that always leads us into repentance. You can't fake the touch of God. You can't fake the Spirit of God. We all need the Spirit of God. And look, I love apologetics. I love spending time learning about this stuff, uh, you know, uh, and talking about, you know, they might have found, uh, you know, wheels and of of chariots wheels in the Red Sea. And like, you know, there's a way that this world could have been made and the flood could have happened and they're fighting evidence of this. Sodom and Gomorrah was here and all this stuff. And like all that stuff is interesting and that's going to get your intellect, but it doesn't replace the touch of God in your life. We need the spirit of God. And I'm telling you, the spirit of God is here today. He is touching people. He is speaking to you. Open your heart and allow him. Look what Nicodemus says, by the way. He comes to Jesus, verse 2, at night, and says, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher who's come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. He's like, I know there's something special about you. I know that you are from God because something happened that doesn't normally happen. Something happened... When you are touched by Jesus, it changes you in a way that you can't really explain. I'm feeling peace like I've never felt before. I'm feeling joy like I've never felt before. Maybe you've been touched and been healed before. Maybe, maybe God is speaking to you. Maybe you're encouraged. Maybe you're excited. Maybe you're usually caught in negativity and you're just feeling a spirit of gratitude in your soul. This is what Jesus can do with his presence. And, and Nicodemus is just sitting in front of Jesus and he's like, look, I know you have to come from God. I know there's, there's something special. Nobody can do the miraculous things. Let Jesus preach for himself. Let Jesus speak for himself. All you have to do is bring people to Jesus. You don't have to do any of these tactics. You just have to show him who Jesus is. Jesus will do all the work. Now, it's a dangerous thing for Nicodemus here. And I say it's dangerous. It's one of those things. It's dangerous, but it's, it's a good kind of dangerous It's dangerous when you are touched by Jesus. Because when you taste and see 
the Lord, you're going to learn that he's good. You're going to learn, forget not his benefits. Forget not who he is. He will restore you. He will redeem you. So it's dangerous. It can be dangerous to go to a Bible study where you hear the word of God and it speaks right to you. It can be dangerous to go to a worship night. It can be dangerous to, to read a book that, was, that is a, a, a biblical book or a, a theological book. It can be dangerous. And look what Nicodemus does. He's touched, and he's, it's almost like the hook's already in. All right? In verse 4, he says, okay, Jesus, how can a man be born when he's old? Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born. Okay? He's got questions. And here's, here's something about following Jesus. You're going to have questions when you follow Jesus. All your questions are not going to be answered. But we have this interesting juxtaposition, these two different things that are going on at the same time, where Nicodemus is inspired, but he's also confused. I feel like that's what it's like to follow Jesus as well. Sometimes I can't even, you want to put a theology to everything, you want to explain everything, but you're just like, I don't really know how to explain this. I, I, I love the response of the blind man in the New Testament. He's like, and the Pharisees press him, what do you mean Jesus healed you of your sight? What do you mean you couldn't see before? He's like, listen, I don't really understand either. I just know I once was blind, but now I see. I, I just know I, I used to be this way, and now he's made me this way. This is what it will be when it comes to following Jesus. It's going to transform you. It's going to touch you. And don't be surprised if you're left a little bit confused when you're following Jesus. It's okay. You're going to walk with him. You're going to learn from him. He wants to adopt you. So Nicodemus is inspired, but he's confused. And we get to verse 9, and he says this. How can this be? He's got more questions. And it says this in verse 10. Jesus says, you're Israel's teacher said Jesus, and you don't understand these things? All right. So Jesus is like, you're the one whose job it is to be a religious leader, and you don't understand this? You know what this tells me? This tells me everybody needs Jesus. The religious people need Jesus. The sinners need Jesus. Those who are walking on the line of gray, everybody needs Jesus. Because you know what? We're not following leaders. We're following him. He's the one that's leading us. Following Jesus is not just following a philosophical lifestyle. Jesus is so much more than that. He's so much more than some, it's not just like following Jesus is, you know, you're following different ways of Jesus and different sayings of Jesus. and do Like Gandhi even did that. Gandhi loved uh, the Sermon on the Mount. So many people love the, the ways of Jesus and the principles of Jesus, but Jesus is a person. And it's not a way that Jesus, it, Jesus is the way. It's following him. It's walking with him. In fact, the early Christians, when they followed Jesus, they weren't called Christians. They were called followers of the way. And they're not saying a way, the way. They were followers of Jesus they walked with Jesus. They had a relationship with Jesus. It wasn't boiled down to a, a formula or a principle or this is how we do these things. Or It's actually communing with him and walking with him. This is what Jesus is always inviting for us. Now, we could invite people to join our club, the Christian club, the first missionary club, or we can invite people to follow Jesus, to walk with Jesus, to get to know him. You know, when people come with questions, I don't know the answer to your questions, but I know we can get on our knees and we can ask the, the one who will give us the answer. I know we can walk with him. Pastors need Jesus. The tax collectors needed Jesus. The rulers needed Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. Nobody has found their way on their own. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. I need Jesus. You need Jesus. And he breaks it down even further. It says in verse 13, Jesus is trying to explain him all these spiritual things in spiritual ways. And he says, no one's gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. He's basically showing him, you as a religious leader, you don't understand this because I've been up to heaven. 
I've been in there in, my, in the spirit. I've seen the spiritual things. I understand the spiritual things. We are best off following Jesus, not some kind of leaders, but specifically him. And he, he says, and we'll get back to this, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him shall have eternal life. And then he says, for God so loved the world he gave his only son, and whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God, didn't come to con- or for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Um, is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned because he's not believed in the name of the one and only son. This is the verdict. Lights come into the world, but men love the darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who hates the light and will not come into the light is for the fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly what they have done and they have done through God. Okay. So we get this picture here. This is, by the way, the saddest part of John chapter 3, by the way. He says, God loved the world so much he gave his son Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The whole reason Jesus came was for us to have eternal life. He didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. But whoever doesn't call on him stands condemned. And then he gives a statement, and he says, those who will not step into the light do it because they love the darkness. Now, here's the thing. Jesus uses uh, a lot of symbolism when he talks I think there's no better picture of what it means to follow Jesus than to walk in the light versus the darkness. The darkness, if you've ever been in pitch black, it's really hard to find settings where it's pitch black. You know, we have the stars at night. We have the lights from the city. But when it is pitch black and you can't even see your hand in front of your face, it's a little scary. I know I've had to come into the church sometimes in the middle of the night uh, to get some stuff. You got that pit in your stomach and you're like running real quick, and then you think there's shadows behind you, you know? (laughs) And you're like trying to get to your office. You don't know where the light switch is, so you're just trying to get to your office. It's kind of, it's, it it kind of is scary. It gives you a pit. You don't know where you're going. You're running into things. You're so confused. Also, in the darkness, oftentimes it's cold. There's no heat. It's, you get this picture of just a depressing, anxiety-filled, seen. And he says, men love to be in the darkness for fear of exposure into the light. And I think there's a couple reasons, actually, people don't step into the light. I think that's one of them. They're scared. If I step into the light and Jesus starts bringing out some of these things, I'm scared for them to be exposed and people to see who I was. But I also think some people just don't even know anything else but the darkness. They've never experienced joy. They've never experienced peace. They've never experienced love. What they thought was love was their parents when they were younger, but they were abused in a certain way. And so it's not so much they love the darkness, it's that they, the darkness is kind of all they knew. It's, it's kind of the only, it's the place where, where they've always been at. And it takes a lot of faith for somebody to step into the light from the darkness. It is a step of faith. It it is Jesus reaching out his hand and touching us, but it's also a step of faith for your part. Following Jesus is saying yes to him. It's looking to him. It's allowing him to transform you. Now, let's get back to the key passage here. Verse 14 and 15 said, and this is the verse, by the way, we, I feel like we skip the most. We kind of just run, run by it really fast. Just as Moses lifted up a snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him shall have eternal life. Just as the snake is w- lifted up in the wilderness, we're going to learn you need to turn your eyes to the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that whoever looks to him and believes in him 
shall have eternal life. And I want to talk to you today about rolling snake eyes. All right? Clever, huh? Snake eyes. Now, before I get into this whole thing, there's going to be some smart people in this room that are going to disprove me. Snake eyes aren't always bad to roll, you know? Like, if I'm playing Yahtzee, I might want snake eyes. Or if I'm playing Monopoly and I'm in jail, I, or I'm two spaces from boardwalk, I might want to roll snake eyes. All right, there's some exceptions to this. The majority of things you play, snake eyes are going to be a bad thing. Do you guys know what snake eyes are? Snake eyes are where you, when you roll the dice and there's two dots that look like eyeballs. They call it snake eyes. It's like, it's really bad, especially in the realm of gambling, which nobody in this church gambles, I know, or has ever gambled people of God, okay? Even a friendly wager, we don't do that here, okay? You know, it's so funny because I was like, oh, this would be so cool to have an illustration where I could get weighted dice to, you know, I'd roll it and be like, snake eyes. You know, I had this famous, it was going to be like, snake eyes, you know. And they don't even make weighted dice for snake eyes because it's, it's always a bad roll to do. It's always like, these dice will roll 7 or 11 every time, you know. And so, like, I was checking Amazon and all these different shops and stuff and didn't find it. So there goes my illustration. It's going to be like, snake eyes, all right. But it's not today, so... Snake eyes are, are bad because when you roll them, usually you lose all your money. Usually you lose the game. Usually uh, you end up uh, not winning. And why I say snake eyes, I know it's a, this passage has nothing to do with dice. It has everything to do with lifting of a snake. I know that, okay? But the, the deeper meaning still remains true. Rolling, rolling the dice, it's all oftentimes like the imagery they're going to show us here, rolling the dice is very similar to living your life trying to earn your salvation, trying to do good things. It's like rolling weighted snake eyes, ro rolling weighted dice, which will lead you to death. Now, we're going to get into this passage. It's a very bizarre story, I want to tell you, and it's in the Old Testament. It just so happens to be in this book called the Book of Numbers, okay? Now, I know, some of you are already like, oh, man. Well, we've been in a series in the Book of Numbers called the Wild, Wild Wilderness, and uh, I know you thought Easter we were going to get away from that, but we're not. We're going to go uh, to Numbers. But here's the thing. I know this is going to feel like a very bizarre and awkward passage. It's going to kind of seem out there. Many of these Old Testament passages are going to feel bizarre and awkward because they're kind of an incompleted passage. What I mean by that is what Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 17 and 18, when he comes, he says this, don't think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. He's talking about the Old Testament. I have not come to abolish them. I have come to fulfill them. So many times we read stories in the Old Testament and they feel awkward and they feel weird to us, not because those stories... I mean, I think some people think Jesus came and he just abolished those things. Like, the Old Testament doesn't even matter anymore. We're just going to read the New Testament. And that's not true. What happened is when Jesus came, he came to fulfill the Old Testament. So now, this equation that we have that was incomplete, now it's going to make sense in the light of the cross. In fact, we should always look through the lens of the cross when we look at the Old Testament. Now, same goes vice versa, though. You know, it's not just now we can throw out the Old Testament. We get so many amazing spiritual insights by looking at the Old Testament through the lens of the cross. So we're going to look at this story, Numbers chapter 21. It's a story when Israel is in the midst of the wilderness. And we'll start with verse 4. It says, they traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient along the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There's no bread. There's no water. We detest this miserable food. And the Lord sent venomous snakes among them, and it bit the people, and many of the Israelites died. Now, 
Israel is complaining. They are in the midst of the wilderness. You really have to understand the backstory. God had just done so many amazing, miraculous things for Israel. He provided food for them in the wilderness. He split the Red Sea, led them out of bondage, out of slavery. He brought freedom. And in the midst of all this, they are grumbling and complaining that the path that they are following God in is miserable. Okay? So it's leading them to sin. They are complaining so much, it is at the point of sin. Now, you might think, well, is complaining really a sin? You know, like, like I, sometimes we just got to be real with our emotions. I mean, if you're, if you're complaining more than you are worshiping, your heart is probably sinning. You're probably uh, meditating on the wrong things. They're just complaining, and they're sinning against God, and they've missed the mark. This is the picture of all of us, by the way. Now, I think too often we roll the dice of life, and we think, you know, God is just going to see my good things in life, and he's going to give me favor. And we're just rolling the dice. Because honestly, we're kind of making up in our mind what we think the standard God is making for us is. We think his standard is, well, if we've done some good things in our life, he's going to give me a pass. But God set the standard pretty clear in the Old Testament. He said the standard is holiness. He said to Adam and Eve in the garden, he said, you can do anything, but don't do this one thing. And Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and they missed the mark by disobeying God. Later, he gave the Ten Commandments. God should be first in your life. No idols. You know, you shall not steal. You shall not lie. You shall not covet. And we look at that list, and we're like, yikes. I've probably done a couple of those things. We've missed the mark of what God has. And this, we find ourselves in the exact same place that Israel find its, finds itself. And they roll snake eyes. And all of a sudden, in the midst of their complaining, venomous snakes come up in the wilderness, and they bite the people. And some of them lose their life. Now, this is a very symbolic moment. Like I said, you need to look at the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament, even through the lens of the Older Testament. Okay? In the book of Genesis... You have the first sin that ever happened. And Satan came in the form of what? A snake, a serpent. He came and he said, did God really say blank? Did God really say you shouldn't eat from every, any fruit from the, from the garden? Did, did he really say, maybe, maybe it was because of this, and he used his craftiness. He came in the form of the snake. And so it's ironic that when, when we look at this passage, the very thing that leads man into sin is the very thing that poisons him in the end. It's, it's our life choices. It's, it's our, uh, our lifestyles. It's the things that we're doing uh, that are away from God. Those very things, the very sin and the very things that we walk in our life that are away from God's will are the very things that are going to consume you someday. We might think we know better. We might think well, I'll be okay. I can keep this thing in my life. But no matter what it is, if it is outside the will of God, it will consume you someday. And this is what we find with the Israelites. There's these venomous snakes. And we see this symbolic thing where it bites them, it poisons them. And then it says this. The people came to Moses and said, we sinned. When we spoke against the Lord and against you, pray to the Lord that he'll take away the snakes from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a snake, put it on a pole. Anyone who's bitten from it and looks at it will live. So Moses made a bronze snake, put it on a pole. And then when anyone was bit by the snake and looked at the bronze snake, it lived. Now, you might look at this story and you're like, if this is supposed to be a symbol of the cross, why didn't Moses make a cross and put it up in the sky? Why did he make a bronze snake and hold it up that anybody that looks at it would live again? This is because Jesus actually became sin for us. Jesus actually became the curse. Jesus actually took our place for us. See, Jesus lived a life that was perfectly aligned with the will of God. He never walked away from it. He never did anything wrong. 
He was blameless up until the day he died, and he held true to the things of God. And it says the Bible says that he became sin when he knew no sin so that we could become his righteousness. And the curse that sin brings into this life, Jesus became that very curse for us so that we could live again. And all he says is, you must look to me and I'll give you life. Now, you might think of that passage in John as just as the Lord was lifted up like a snake and you might think of him on the cross. But what they're actually referring to is just as Jesus was lifted into the sky. Just as Jesus rose from the grave, just as Jesus, Jesus ascended into heaven, our hope is found in the resurrection of Jesus. That anyone who looks to him and believes in him, you shall live forever. The Bible says this, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now for you, you might be at this place in life where you've just been walking and you've been doing things your way, and it's been leading you to depression, to anxiety, to, to hard, hardships, to all these things that are being brought up by your own, and the very lifestyle and things that you're choosing are the very snakes that are poisoning you, and you don't even realize it. Some are constricted around your legs, and Jesus says, let me take that from you. All you need to do is look to me. And follow me. It takes a lot of faith, like I said earlier. It takes stepping out of the darkness into the light and saying, Jesus, I want to follow you. It's a very simple thing, but it's also a very difficult thing at the same time. It's simple, but it's not easy. It's saying, Jesus, I want to surrender my life to you. Many people had that offer in the New Testament, and only a few of them decided to follow Jesus. You had his disciples who actually let down their nets. They were fishermen, and they said, I want to follow you, Jesus. I want to give my life to you. Today could be your day to have eternal life and to walk with Jesus and to allow him to change and transform your spirit. I want to read that passage one more time in John chapter 3. It says this, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. Because God loved the world so much, he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Would you bow your heads this morning? It's a very simple but not easy thing to do. It's coming to a place with the Lord and lifting your eyes to him and saying, Jesus, I want to follow you. Jesus, I want you to take the reins. I want you to lead my life. I want you to have control of everything. I want you to give me purpose. I want you to transform me. I want you to direct me. I want you to lead me. And I want you, God, to change the desires of my heart. I have news for you. If you decide to follow Jesus, he is going to lead you into a life of joy, into a life of peace, into a life of power and transformation. I want to invite you today could be your day that you follow Jesus. It takes a moment it takes you saying, Jesus, I want to follow you and praying to him and starting that relationship with him. I want to open that invitation to you. Lord, would you stir our hearts, those who are feeling a touch from you, God, those who are feeling uh, your presence pulling you, pulling them to you, Lord. I pray that you would complete your work and give them faith to step out of the darkness and choose you today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us? Let's sing.
Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow you to look around the room. These are people singing the song that need that grace from the Lord. All of us need it. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us need a relationship with him. All of us need him to restore us and to lead us and to give us new life. And all of us have either needed or had a born again experience. Today could be yours. I want to invite you. If the Lord is stirring something in your heart and you want to make today the day that you follow Jesus, what better day than Easter? I want to invite you to come for up to the front at the end of the service. I'd love to pray for you. The elders would love to pray for you here. Um, happy Easter, everyone. He's risen? He's risen. Awesome. Well, God bless. Go in peace. <laughs>